So this is sort of a research in progress because I don't really have any of my data yet. I just got the first data poll. Um, and so it's probably going to be on the relatively short side, but I definitely welcome questions, suggestions, et cetera. And thank you all for being here. So um, the question that I'm, or the sort of problem I'm trying to address is the growing antimicrobial resistance. Um, just a couple background figures. CDC released a landmark report in 2013 that talked about the number of cases and attributable deaths in the US uh, just due to antimicrobial resistant bacteria and other infections, um, including direct and indirect costs. The indirect costs are worth, lost, quality adjusted life years, et cetera. Um, this is expected to be a growing program. I feel like there are a tremendous number of articles in the news, which means that at least it's penetrating the public consciousness. Um, I feel like people tend to underestimate the effects and any studies that have been done um, the populace have actually shown that people are a little bit more um, more likely to believe that doctors are being alarmist than they are to believe that doctors are being correct in sort of attributing the uh, risks associated with antimicrobial resistance. But it's a serious problem. Um, according to a recent uh, study, there was expected to be about a $100 trillion loss in world GDP over the next 35 years, assuming that there's no change in the rate of increase of incidence of antimicrobial resistant infections. Um, this is probably a high line number that's meant to sort of grab people's attention, but in terms of total hit to GDP, it's fairly substantial. Um, CDC report further recommended four specific courses of action. Uh, preventing infections, tracking resistant bacteria, improving the use of antibiotics, and promoting the development of new antibiotics and tests. The research here is to focus primarily on points two and three, so tracking resistant bacteria and improving the appropriate use of antibiotics. So um, I came at this with two specific goals. Um, the first one is sort of generally to figure out how the location of patient residents prior to admission affects the risk of presentation for antimicrobial resistant infections. And then specific aim number two is attempting to optimize initial choice of antibiotics for patients presenting with bacterial infections. Wrapped up in specific aim number one is prediction for essentially all of the other factors, um, but very little has been done about where patients live in the community and how that relates to their risk for AMR. Um, so there have been a couple of studies that have shown uh, substantial geographic variation at the country level and a very few studies that have shown sort of prox, you know, proximity to different uh, structures in the environment such as sewage outflow or factory farms or a person's occupation can affect their risk for antimicrobial resistant infection. Um, but this hasn't been really done in a serious epidemiological sense in a way that I was able to find. So, for example, um, there's EARS, which is this European Antimicrobial Resistance Surveillance Network um, that essentially comes up with a whole bunch of these maps that show uh, the different uh, prevalence of antimicrobial resistance uh, by bacteria and by uh, antibiotic. I chose this one because it seems to have one of the most prominent gradients, but you can see in Bulgaria there's a substantially higher risk for immunoglycoside resistant Escherichia coli than you get up in Iceland. Um, this is not particularly surprising uh, that there would be this level of heterogeneity, but when people look at the US, uh, we haven't really tried to break it down that way to the same extent. Um, there's likely a substantial amount of variation, not only between cities, but also within cities and hospital referral areas that's not captured by the current studies. Um, and as I said before, bacterial culture positivity or AMR our bacterial culture positivity is associated with exposure uh, to particular structures. Um, a lot of the work that's been done so far has been done regarding occupations. So people who work in concentrated animal feeding organizations, um, people who work near sewage lagoons, people who work in sewage treatment plants, things along those lines. So uh, this problem has been approached before from a couple of different angles, um, but it's typically been with sort of convenient samples of who's available and usually looking at uh, immunosuppressed populations. So for example, uh, there's a fairly large study of a couple hundred people looking at 
prevalence of cefepime resistant bacteria among hematology patients as sort of a way of trying to figure out which antibiotic would be the best initial choice depending on demographic information. Um, there have been at least one or two studies that have been done on looking at antimicrobial resistance in strep pneumonia among all comers in the emergency department or fluoroquinolone resistance among all comers to the emergency department. Um, and then because it's been getting a lot of press, ESBL gram-negative rods at the ICU um, has also been a little bit more of a studied topic. But none of these have taken into account where a patient lives in a community aside from what sort of facility the person is living in. So somebody who comes from an assisted living facility, comes from a nursing facility, um, comes from a short-term rehab or a long-term acute care facility, all these people are at substantially increased risk for an antimicrobial resistant infection because they essentially have increased contact with the uh, healthcare system. But it's not a huge stretch to go from there to believe that it could be that there are some neighborhoods um, where you have a higher rate of infection due to any number of factors, either because you have one of these structures in the community or because that community happens to be near a sewage treatment outflow or something along those lines. Um, so the data I'm using from this is through the uh, Integrated Clinical and Research Data Repository at UCLA, which contains a comprehensive information about every patient that's been treated since 2006. Um, we switched over systems in 2013, so the data after 2013 is substantially more comprehensive than the uh, data prior to 2013, um, but it's all there in terms of microbiology results, speciation, sensitivities, demographic information, including a person's home address, where they're coming from, what sort of living facility they were in prior to admission, um, and then clinical data in terms of what their diagnosis was, survival outcomes during hospitalization. We unfortunately don't have indexing with a social security index uh, to figure out people's actual date of death at this time. Um, but you can track them through multiple hospitalizations, assuming that all those hospitalizations happened at UCLA. Um, so I had this IRB approved in December, and I just got access to my data literally last week in the middle of finals, so I haven't had too much opportunity to take a look through it. Um, but I have access to all uh, patients over the age of 18 who have a positive culture from any source since 2006 at UCLA's two main campuses, which are Ronald Reagan in Westwood and then the UCLA Santa Monica in Santa Monica. Um, this is about 44,000 patients across multiple visits. Um, but unfortunately, I don't have much more information than that at this time. Um, and for this study, AMR is just broadly defined as something that's not susceptible to narrow spectrum antibiotics. So including fungal atypical infections, bacteria resistant to specific, antibi specific antibiotic classes, et cetera. Uh, this is more of an exploratory analysis at this point, and then my goal is to focus up a little bit as uh, I figure out what's possible. So I guess I'm falling prey to the same convenient sample problem that everybody else is, but hopefully my convenient sample is several orders of magnitude larger. Um, so the proposed data elements that I was able to pull out are demographic information, age, sex, race, ethnicity, uh, BMI, height, weight, living accommodation, and then um, encounter information, year of hospitalization, why they came in, which hospital they were, admitted to, which type of unit, ICU versus floor, what their primary diagnosis is, what their vital signs are, what their comorbidities are, whether they have indwelling devices, if they have prior operations, their entire medical history, their entire history of medications, whether or not they're IV drug users, um, et cetera. The information that I'm hoping to get from their home address, which can be converted to a geocode, and then located within a census tract or a census block. Um, from there, it's possible to derive income information as well as the racial ethnic composition of their neighborhood, um, what type of house they're living in, or at least whether it's an apartment complex or freestanding structure. And then my other goal is to partner with some colleagues at the School of Public Health who look at community structures around Los Angeles to figure out if they're living next to or near a factory farm, probably not too many of those in downtown LA, but sewage treatment outflows, things along those lines are probably a little bit more um, common in Los Angeles. 
Um, so the idea is the sort of initial phase of this will be to look at antimicrobial resistance, and this is people presenting to the emergency department with an antimicrobial resistant infection, and analyze that for geographical clustering, uh, and then cross-reference that with information on factory farms and waste treatment. And I keep coming back to the factory farms and waste treatment because those are really the only ones that have been uh, studied in the literature that I was able to find. And then also attempt to look for previously unstudied associations with uh, presenting with antimicrobial resistance among other uh, community structures. Um, so the unit of analysis is the individual patient visit with some eye towards whether or not that person has been admitted to UCLA before. Um, and then the goal is to use this to fit a model to predict initial presentation with antimicrobial resistance. And that's using all demographic fa factors available to the person. Um, the focus here is on community placement um, because that hasn't really been looked at before. Uh, but the goal is to sort of see if I can come up with a strong predictive model taking in as much information as we can to try to create a score for each person about what their AMR risk would be and then attempt to prospectively validate that. Um, right now, the initial plan is multivariate and logistic regression for starters, but I understand substantially more sophisticated techniques will probably be necessary, which is part of what I'm studying in my PhD at the School of Public Health at this point. Um, so the goal is ultimately to be able to recommend appropriate antibiotics for a given patient at the point of presentation, sort of knowing um, what you know and see if it's possible to figure out, well, this person would benefit from ex extended spec uh, spectrum uh, antibiotics as opposed to somebody who would probably benefit more from narrow spectrum. Um, so the conceptual model here um, I'm presenting, but it really doesn't add any information to what I've said. The idea is you essentially have all of your demographic information around here, which influences your medical comorbidities, prior antimicrobial usage, living accommodation, environmental structures, and you get to the question of antimicrobial resistance, whether that's a degree of resistance or the presence of specific organisms, and then hopefully you'll be able to come out with a choice of optimal antibiotic or at least optimal antibiotic class um, or at least be able to say, well, despite the fact that this person has been hospitalized within the last 90 days, their actual risk for antimicrobial resistant infection is relatively low, and so perhaps you can spare them one of these broader spectrum antibiotics and save that uh, resistance for somebody else. Um, so there's some anticipated challenges that come with any uh, view of retrospective, largely administrative data um, I do have access to the patient charts, but looking at 44,000 different charts is going to be somewhat difficult unless I have access to a whole lot of undergrads or med students, um, which I don't at this point. Um, so the time since the last admission is important, but it's not easy to obtain this if the patient was seen at a different hospital. Um, there's a, an effort underway through Doug Bell's lab to attempt to integrate uh, data warehousing across several different hospitals within the greater Los Angeles area. Um, including Cedars-Sinai, the VA, um, and a couple of other places. This is probably a couple years off before we actually have a, a group repository for all of those, but it is possible for me to attempt to collaborate with some people at these other hospitals and mesh data sets. Uh, UCLA primarily gets people from the west side of Los Angeles. We don't get too many people from the south side um, or the east side, which means that uh, our population may be a little bit too homogenous to actually be able to pull out these sorts of uh, differences appropriately. Um, as said before, the data prior to 2013 are not as robust as the more recent data. Um, I don't anticipate this is going to be a large problem because most of the data that I need is still there. Again, there's a lot of exploratory analysis that I need to do prior to moving ahead with this. And then as stated before, potentially necessary statistical modeling is beyond my current capabilities. Um, but that's why I'm involved in this consortium. So here are the references, and at this point, I can open this up for questions. Okay, this is Andrew. I'll start. Okay. Um, well, I the messages, um, but uh, yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. Start with Ali's question there. 
Okay, yeah. So what would the predictive power have to be to be clinically useful? And this is, this is a good question um, because ultimately we're incredibly conservative and I think it would depend on how sick the person is when they're coming in. If someone comes in in severe septic shock, um, I don't think there's anything you could tell an emergency department physician or an ICU physician that would make them say, you know what, this is the one person we're not going to give broad spectrum antibiotics to. So I think uh, in some situations, we're kind of the, the goal of getting narrow spectrum antibiotics is a little bit uh, is a little bit ambitious. But for somebody who comes in with sort of a hospital acquired or a community acquired pneumonia, or someone who comes in from a nursing facility but otherwise has essentially no risk factors and isn't that sick, the sort of person where you can figure something out, um, you know, in the next 24 hours without taking a huge risk. My goal is that instead of hitting the person hard with broad spectrum antibiotics at the beginning and then stepping down, you could move over to a potential step up strategy. And so I would say that if someone comes in and I knew that they had a 10, 20% chance of having an antimicrobial resistant infection as opposed to a 30 or higher percent chance that I personally would feel comfortable putting them on narrow spectrum antibiotics just to see what happens um, and see if that's okay. Uh, but unfortunately, all of these are sort of very clinician dependent. Um, so trying to move to a standardized algorithm would be the ultimate goal, but it's going to be difficult. Um, my goal is essentially to be another factor that people can consider uh, when coming in. But I agree, the clinical utility here is, is going to be hard to get unless I see something really dramatic. Thank you. Andrew? <laughs> Um, so, so I just want to make sure that, that the records you have access to are all pathogen infections from which you can isolate out the AMR cases versus not. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. Well, I have all positive cultures, which means I have, there are a tremendous number of people who aren't caught in this dragnet who probably had an infection but never cultured positive for anything. Got it. Yeah. And, and then how detailed is sort of that AMR diagnosis. So you have down, I mean, so when somebody comes in with an infection and, and, and gets that cultured, what happens? Is it tested across a broad, a broad spectrum of antibiotics and so you get susceptible to these and resistant to these? Yes. Yeah. It's essentially, I, I don't know what your background is, but it's essentially what you would get in a hospital. So it's the full printout of, you know, this is Pseudomonas aeruginosa and it is resistant to cefepime at an MIC of less than, four, uh, you know, greater than 16, and it's sensitive to oxacillin at an MIC of less than whatever. Um, so you do get the full printout for all, all tested antibiotics. Got it. And then, um, hmm, okay, cool. Uh, and then is that, de is that dependent, like, on which bug is identified, or essentially do all uh, all bacteria get put against the same uh, panel of antibiotics. And for context, I have no clinical background at all, so. No worries. Um, yeah. So it depends. There are some bacteria that, or fungi that you'll see that are widely considered to be contaminants, and essentially they'll report that out and say, you know, there's candida in this person's mouth, which is essentially useless because there's candida in everybody's mouth and they won't uh, run any sensitivities on that. You don't get exactly the same sensitivities for every bacteria because some bacteria are considered to be just so widely resistant to certain antibiotics that it's not even worth testing. Um, and then obviously, if you're looking at a fungus versus a bacterial infection, you're going to get a different type of printout. Um, there are some uh, antibiotics that are tested across almost every bacterium that you'll see. So for example, ceftriaxone, some penicillins, things along those lines. But typically, you won't test, you know, strep against some of the heavier hitting antibiotics that we reserve for something like Pseudomonas. So there is some limited power there um, if you really want to be able to test resistance across every single antibiotic, uh, every single bacterium. But I believe there are some antibiotics that I could test across essentially everything that comes across the desk. Got it. Uh, one question about aligning, um, I mean, your, your geographic diversity issue, um, yeah. are, are, is it possible to, um, you know, I know there are UC-wide medical initiatives to, to integrate across UC-wide hospitals. Uh -huh. um, any thoughts there? 
Yeah, I'd love to get into UC Braid at some point. So my understanding of this is that I would essentially need, at this point, I would need a collaborator at each of those institutions. Um, so the future directions for this is hopefully if I'm able to find anything useful here that I can take that to people at other UC institutions and other institutions across town um, and start to build this up into a much larger model. Um, because I, I think the real strength of something like this comes when you have a lot of geographic diversity. Um, it would be interesting because Santa Monica looks very different from West LA um, to see if there are any differences there. But for the most part, the west side of Los Angeles, including Santa Monica, is relatively wealthy. Um, you know, sort of our major factor is how far you are from the ocean as opposed to, you know, how, like what the composition of the neighborhood is. So it would be cool to see something there. Um, but I fully understand that the geographic location may not help me very much. Um, but if I see any signal at all, the goal is to be able to kind of use that as a jumping off point for further collaboration. Got it. Makes sense. Uh, one last note I'll, I'll mention. Uh, you, you made the comment about uh, looking through how many over 44,000 charts. Uh, you know, I think within uh, the center and within the VDK consortium as a whole, there is some uh, expertise in terms of natural language processing in, uh, in, in medical records, if that were um, ever something that you wanted to uh, pursue uh, short of recruiting an army of undergraduates. Yeah, absolutely. And, and thank you. It's something that I've looked into. And the problem, the problem that I'm trying to solve as far as like a nat from a natural language language processing perspective is probably not substantially more sophisticated than just looking for keywords and the words around them. So it may be an approach that I need to take sort of depending on what that what those data look like. But unfortunately, I, I haven't had the opportunity to do the exploratory analysis that would even let me answer that question. But it's right. definitely a direction that would be useful to go. Right. I and mean, one thing that you could get from uh, sort of NLP systems is, you know, uh, where you could work up from concepts, right? If you, if you for example, I, I don't know, you uh, were interested in relationships to neurological diseases. Uh, rather than enumerating all neurological diseases, right? Um, you know, you wouldn't have a keyword for Alzheimer's or Parkinson's or blah, 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 blah. Right. Um, some of the NLP systems would relate that to an ontology that then you could make sort of slightly broader or more specific queries. Got it. Thank you. Sure. Are there any other questions for Stefan? Uh, okay, if not, uh, thank you, Stefan, for the great presentation. Uh, that, Absolutely. That concludes uh, today's conference. Um, thank you, everyone, for attending. All right. Thank you, everybody. Yeah, thank you.